Thank you, ladies. What a beautiful song. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Good to see each and every one. May we have a word of prayer. Our Lord, our God, our Savior and Redeemer, we praise thy holy name. We come before thy holy presence asking, O Lord, that thou will hear our petitions. We pray for those who are sick that they may be healed. And we ask, O Lord, that thy Holy Spirit may descend upon each and every one here this morning, that we may glorify thy name in all that we say, all that we do. Lead us, direct us, and forgive us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. Good morning. Please stand as we sing our hymn of praise, number 197, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Please stand. of Christ. Good morning indeed and welcome. Don't put away your lawnmower yet. It's coming this week, I think, with a little sunshine. 
a little bit of grass growth for the last time. Welcome to First Baptist Church, especially if you uh, are a guest. We hope you'll sign in if you are so we can welcome you further in the days ahead. May I emphasize that tonight we have our Sunday School Banquet at 530, and we have some empty seats for which we have bought food, Mary tells me, and so come on and join us at 530. Sit together with your Sunday School class. Show appreciation for your teacher. We have a guest speaker coming from Louisville. Hope to see you tonight at 530. And then on Wednesday night, we'll have our monthly outreach emphasis and go out and visit folks, invite them to church. We're having our Sanctuary Choir Christmas Cantata rehearsals on Wednesday nights, as you'll note there. Please come and take part. On October the 27th at 6.30, we have the WMU Banquet. Guest speaker Larry Koch from Disaster Relief. And not too early to mark your calendar for Thanksgiving on November the 22nd, we'll have our annual Thanksgiving dinner and we have a guest concert group that's been here a couple of times and been well received. Hope you can come. Are there other announcements? If not, may we continue in worship as we stand and sing hymn number 444, Trust and Obey. 447, I'm sorry.
Debbie Riggs, would you please take that microphone and lead us in our offertory prayer? Father in heaven, what a blessing it is to be in your house on this day. Father, we pray that this tithe will be used to help further your kingdom, that you will bless this gift and the giver, that we may serve you in a way that is pleasing to you. Help us that all that we say and do would glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today we want to extend our sympathy to Wanda Dobson and her family in the passing of her husband, uh, Leroy Dobson, this past week. We think of Virginia Blanton this morning, who's recovering from knee replacement surgery. She has been moved to Cardinal Hill Hospital. She had her surgery at Norton's Hospital in Louisville. I saw her yesterday and she uh, is progressing well. And of course, those in assisted living or nursing homes, Ella Saylor, Ben Swanner, Elizabeth Ann Spa. And also, I appreciate you keeping our daughter Grace in your prayers. She's had a good couple of days after a very eventful week, and we pray that continues. With the events of this week, I did not get to select a sermon passage or write a sermon until yesterday, and so thus it is not in the bulletin which was printed Friday, but we'll be reading from John chapter 12, John chapter 12, beginning with verse 20, 20 through 26. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew went with Philip, and they told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there shall my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. God will bless the reading of his word, and we will entitle the message this morning, We Would See Jesus. May we pray. Our Father, we're mindful of your presence with us in song and in prayer and meditation, proclamation, May we be sensitive to that presence in listening, in allowing as we open the scriptures to examine them for our lives to be opened to that the scriptures may examine us. And may we heed your presence by the will to depart and follow Jesus Christ whom we seek to see this morning and in whose name we pray. 
Amen. to wish that I could rewrite history I used to dream that each mistake could be erased then I could just pretend I never knew the me back then I used to pray that you would take this shame away hide all the evidence of who I've been but it's the memory of the place you brought me from that takes me to my knees and even though I'm free heal the wound but leave the scar a reminder of how merciful you are I am broken torn apart take the pieces of this heart heal the wound but leave the scar not lived a life that boasts of anything. I don't take pride in what I bring. But I'll build an altar with the rubble that you found me in. And every stone will see of what you can redeem. Heal the wound but leave God. A reminder of how merciful you are. How merciful you are. I am broken, torn apart. Take the pieces of this heart. Heal the wound that leaves. Don't let me forget. A reminder of how merciful you are. I am broken, torn apart. Take the pieces of this heart. Heal the wound and leave the scar. Heal the wound but leave broken torn apart take the pieces of this heart heal the wound but leave the scar leave the scar
Thank you, girls, very much. I was a teenager and in high school, and my little brother came home excited one day after school and said, Mom, guess what? I made first chair in the trumpet section. I was one of three boys, and my older brother and I, in particular, were more interested in athletics than music. My mother was a musician and tried to make musicians out of us, her boys, and all of us took piano for five years. I wish I hadn't forgotten everything I learned, but my little brother stayed with it a little more and learned to play the trumpet and got first chair, and he had to tell me what that meant. I didn't know that much about what that meant. It meant that he, in auditioning, had played the trumpet better than the other trumpeters in the orchestra, the band. It meant that he'd done very well. And I learned at that point what that meant. And later, when I learned the expression playing second fiddle, I learned that it was a, a misuse of the term for if someone was, it was said of them that their second fiddle, it was used as almost a demeaning term, somehow inferior or didn't get to play first fiddle. Somehow second class hadn't achieved all that well, second fiddle but it actually had a much nobler meaning, as musicians know, that no dishonor in playing second fiddle. For in the orchestra or the band, the, the best violinist or trumpetist or flautist or whomever plays the first in the first chair and then those who follow him or her support his or her sound, give it more volume, lend support, stay in tune with the first chair, amplify the sound. And by way of illustration this morning, I want to say that we as disciples are called to play second fiddle to Christ. We are called to stay in tune with Christ. We are called to amplify his sound. We are called to resonate Christ-likeness, if you will, to reverberate, to resound the message of Christ to the world, for we are called to be his witnesses. Therefore, Christ is our model. We have a copy machine in the church office. It's on the blink a little bit lately, needing repair. But when it's functioning normally, it does what we would have considered 50 years ago to be a miracle. Making copies, spitting them out one at a time in rapid function. But to have copies, what do you have to have first? You have to have an original, don't you? You have to lay something on the glass to be duplicated. Christ is our original. Christ is first chair. We are called to be copies of Christ to the world. I was fascinated as a little boy in visiting both of my grandmothers back in Missouri. They were both seamstresses. They came along in an age born in the 1800s where many women made their own clothes, and more than that, the clothes of all their children, and more than that, often the clothes of many in the town, and she had these models on stands. You remember those days, any of you? Anybody ever make your own clothes? And I was fascinated by that. And I'd go visit Grandma, and I'd like, I enjoyed watching her, and she would before she would get certain cloth that she liked, the right color, the right texture, the right material. Oh, she could go to sales. She could pick out cloth and get it for almost nothing. Maybe it had gone out of style. And then before she did anything, she'd open a drawer and piled in that drawer thick on crinkly 
almost transparent paper were what? Patterns. Some of you do remember those days. Patterns, and she would get those patterns out and hold them up and sometimes have me hold them up. And she would choose a pattern, and then she would lay the cloth out, oftentimes on the floor if the table was too full of something else, and lay the pattern on top of the cloth, and then do what? Straight pins, and pin the pattern to the cloth. And then she would cut the cloth around the pattern. Jesus Christ is the pattern, you see. He's the original for the copy machine. He's the pattern for the clothing. Another illustration, I came along at a time when digital photography had not come along. And we learned how to take pictures with film. And my father was an avid photographer. He has stacks and reels of of stills and eight millimeter pictures of World War II, pictures of Dachau and his whole pilgrimage and the Battle of the Bulge. And, and he came home from the war apparently before I was born and learned how to develop film and had his own dark room and a big old thing that looked like a, a, a giant microscope that he would use and he had pans of water and he would take the negative. Sometimes he'd let me go in there with him. He'd put the negative in the pan of water and, and on and on and develop film and make copies. As many copies as he wanted, but he could never make a copy of a positive unless he had what? A negative. The film itself. A picture. Christ is the negative or whatever illustration that you like. What does Christ look like? What does Christ sound like? What does it mean to be copies off of the shape and dimensions of Christ? And that's what our New Testament is about. To try to get an idea of what this original looks like. He answered the question strangely, which often was the case with Jesus. He often change the subject or didn't answer in a way that was expected. Sir, we would see Jesus. He said, okay, let me give you this snapshot. Quote, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. For if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Jesus is the pattern, the negative, the original, Paul tells us in Philippians, because he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, humbling himself, he became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, And God has highly exalted him, therefore, and given him a name which is above every name, and given him first chair, first fiddle, original pattern for all mankind to follow. The second Adam, Jesus, is our model. In the New Testament, we can study that pattern, and we can learn things about that picture that we are to emulate, such as what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul For whoever would save his life would lose it, and whoever would lose his life for my sake would find it. The original is Jesus. And if you're going to make a copy on, for example, the copy machine, you not only have to have an original, original, what else do you have to have given that you do have a copy machine? You have to have paper. And it's best if that paper is what? Blank. Clean. New, doesn't already have an image on it. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it cannot live. Could that have been the clue that Jesus is giving? The paper's got to be blank. You've got to die first. Nicodemus, you must be born again. And you can't be born again until what? Until you die. Baptism is the picture of burial and resurrection as we immersionists practice it 
death and resurrection. If anyone is in Christ, Paul would write, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away and died. Behold, all things have become new. And this is from God, who's reconciling us to himself in Jesus Christ. We struggle sometimes to be Christian because we don't start with a clean sheet of paper. We bring a lot of images with us. Now and then, Dad would play with trick photography and would do a, take a negative and do a double exposure and have a picture of two people there overlaying each other. When I was a father of three younger children, I took them to the beach and snapped pictures many years ago. And somehow, when we went to New York to show them the Statue of Liberty the next summer, Dad forgot to take the film out and change it. And I went through the whole reel again. And I got pictures like the Statue of Liberty standing on Daytona Beach with my kids standing around the Statue of Liberty and such double exposures. Have you ever done that, Missy? I guess with digital photography, that's not possible. That cleans that up, double exposures. You get the illustration? Paul would say, I'm in a war with my own self in Romans 7. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. The very thing I want to do is the thing that I don't do because we have double exposures in our life. We, know, we have Christ imprinted upon us, but the old man's not gone yet. And so there's a double exposure, and the world sometimes gets a mixed message because we don't show copies of Christ. We show maybe some Christ-likeness, but we show some worldliness too. And which is it, you see? Which is it? The battle goes on, and it's internal. You've got to have an original, and you've got to have a clean sheet of paper. And that's part of what worship is about. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me, wrote the psalmist, so that the impression of Christ can have fresh, clean paper upon which to imprint itself. If we are to be disciples, we are to follow the model of Christ. And how do we do that? Well, he gives us a clue in his answer when he says, Where I am, there will my servant also be. Stay close. I learned in college basketball, if you're going to have a fast break, Adolph Rupp style, if any of you remember him, and this really hasn't changed if you watch basketball today. Get the ball to the center of the court as quickly as you can by way of a pass and not dribble. And if you don't have the ball, fill the lanes on each side. And usually what's called the trailer will get a chance for the basket. That is the first person as the guard gets the ball, maybe to the top of the key, Maybe the foul line, the first guy is being guarded, so he runs on through and he clears out. It's almost like blocking, coach. He clears out the interference. And usually the second guy or the trailer is open. And Coach Davis used to get so angry at Georgetown College if he looked up and there wasn't a trailer. And in rehearsing the drills and running the fast breaks, whoever was second in line going down the lane or maybe even third would have to scream, trailer, trailer. And that tells the man with the ball who doesn't have to look right at him, he's there. He's there. In the book of Hebrews, Christ is called by the author of the great prodromos. In the, Hebrew, in the Greek, that means the forerunner, the pioneer. He clears out and we follow him. We are the trailers because we are staying close to Christ, you see. Stay close to me. That's how you copy Christ. Where I am there, my servant will also be. If he's going to follow me, he's got to stay close. In the army, the first lieutenant tells his troops, follow me. And what does he mean, Jim? He means don't let me out of your sight, doesn't he? It means when he turns around, he's got to see the warriors behind him. Sometimes they turn around, there ain't anybody behind him. We're going to back you up way back. Many alleged believers have claimed some kind of encounter with Jesus at some point in their lives, but they've perhaps lost sight of him since then because they haven't made it their business to keep on following. To be a disciple is to follow Jesus. And where is Jesus? Is he in church? 
Well, we hope so. He promised where two or three, he's not playing a numbers game, where two or three are gathered together in my name, we'll have a worship service. And I'll be there, I promise. So yes, if Christ is being prayed to and his name, if he's being proclaimed, if he's being praised, Christ is there with his people. Well, what about when we leave church? Is he there? Oh, yes. You shall be my witnesses in the world. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men, he told them. Yes, he's in the world. We follow him to church, hopefully, but we don't leave him here. He's going out the door in front of us. Are we following him then? Into the lives of the hurting, the dispossessed, the lonely, or those who have lost our way, which we have to be careful about saying they're lost. We have to be careful about saying that to them. That's a little bit demeaning. That's not probably the place to start relating to somebody who is without Christ. There are better terms, perhaps, and we can get to that with them if we establish a relationship. And finally, Jesus says, in verse 26, and if anyone serves me, who does follow me as the original and tries to copy me, if anyone does that, I promise that the Father will honor him. The Father will honor him. Yes, to be a disciple does mean to share in a reward. Not that that's the motive or it's self-serving, but we don't have to serve God for nothing. Jesus taught that to follow him meant service and cross-bearing, but that there emerges a compensation, if you will. In the words of the secular prophet, the reward of a job well done is what? To have done it. It carries its own reward, you see. Or in the words of the man who preached my baccalaureate sermon in high school, the reward, the reward of doing well is the opportunity to do more. The reward of doing well, of being faithful, is the opportunity to continue to be faithful with what we have learned. That's the payoff, you see. And yes, Paul would write in the by and by in chapter 8 of Romans, for the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. To serve Christ and to follow Christ, however one fares materialistically or in a worldly way, he winds up at the end like the Apostle Paul, who as he looked back on his life, said, I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord will give me, the righteous judge, and all who love his appearing. I'm going to close with the opening of this passage where some Greeks, Gentiles, this is Passover, you see, and there's some Gentiles there in the holy city, John 12, and they'd heard about Jesus somehow. Perhaps it's because he entered into the Decapolis cities earlier in his ministry, into the Greek cities, paving the way to the Gentiles in some of his endeavors. And so they came to Passover looking for Jesus. And who did they ask? They looked up the two disciples who had Greek names, Philip and Andrew, because they were from the city of Bethsaida, the Hellenist, Hellenistic city. And they said, sir... We would like to see Jesus. And so they got together and took him to Jesus. The world says today, I believe, to you and to me, we would see Jesus. We don't have somewhere to take him. You shall be my witnesses, Jesus said. The closest thing they're going to get to see Jesus is who? 
you and me, what do they see? How close do they get? May we pray. Our Father, we are reminded and sobered in this passage that we are to be your representatives to the world. That the best thing the world will know, the closest thing the world will know to Christ's likeness is what some of his followers show them. Help us to hear the cries of the world. We would see Jesus. May we be committed to showing them in our words and in our deeds the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation today is number 314, a hymn that engages our sense of will to follow Christ. May we stand and sing, Whosoever will, and if you have a decision to make to share with God's people, you come and share it as we sing. young ladies who've come to reaffirm their faith in Christ publicly on their birthdays. First of all, Melinda Cooper comes. Her birthday is October the 8th. Happy birthday, Melinda, a few days early. And Jacqueline Brewer, I wanted to call her Jacqueline Nally because that's who she was when I baptized her 15 years ago. She still is, Mom said. Always will be. What's that saying about when a daughter marries, what you win and lose? Happy birthday. Her birthday is past. It's September the 21st. Wonderful. Good to be in God's house together. Amen. Amen. Have a good week. We hope that you'll come to the Sunday school banquet this evening. It'll be a good meal, a good time of fellowship, and a good speaker. Let's bow together for the singing of our choral benediction.